Meet Amar and Sarah. Like you, they work for humanitarian and development organizations. Everyone who works with a humanitarian or development organization anywhere in the world, including staff, volunteers, and contractors, plays an important role in making sure they do no harm to the communities they support. In the community where Amar and Sarah are working, the people have been affected by disaster, conflict, or poverty. Some people, like women, children, and people living with disabilities, may be more at risk of experiencing abuse or harm than others. This is true for programs in humanitarian, development, and non-emergency settings. Humanitarian and development organizations often work in settings with vulnerable and marginalized community members. Workers like Amara and Sarah have a responsibility to treat everyone in the community with respect. Workers must not take advantage of the communities they support. If they do, they will harm individuals. They may destroy the relationship with the community and they may lose their jobs. So what are some of the things Amara and Sarah should be aware of? Workers like Amar and Sarah are in positions of power, whether they are working in an emergency or development setting. As a program officer from outside the community, Amar holds power because of his age, wealth, as compared to the communities where he works, expertise, position, and gender. As a community mobilizer from the local community, Sarah also has power. The community sees her leading activities working closely with other humanitarian and development workers and sharing information about resources and services. Whether true or not, community members often believe that humanitarian and development workers control access to resources and services. In contrast, community members often have little control over access to those things. Because of this, community members may feel they cannot say no to anything these workers ask of them. They might be afraid that if they say no, they or their families will not receive aid or other services. Workers must consider the power that people think they have. They must never abuse their power. Humanitarian and development workers can abuse their power in many ways. One of the most harmful ways is through sexual exploitation and abuse. Sexual exploitation happens when a person uses their position or power and authority to abuse or attempt to abuse a person who is vulnerable or has less power for sexual purposes. Sexual exploitation involves convincing, coercing, or manipulating a person with less power to engage in sexual activity. For example, if a humanitarian or development worker offers extra rations or money in exchange for sex, or a teacher working at the school offers to waive school fees or give the child a higher grade if the child engages in sexual activity with the teacher. Sexual activity includes physical contact, but it can also include other activities where there is no physical contact. For example, engaging in conversations or sharing images of a sexual nature online or by text message. Sexual abuse happens when a person forces someone with less power to participate in sexual activities against their will. For example, if a humanitarian or development worker forces someone to kiss them or participate in sexual activities with them. To help guide humanitarian and development workers like you, Amar and Sarah, and keep program participants and vulnerable communities safe, there are a few important principles that all workers must follow. Humanitarian and development workers must always treat program participants and local communities with respect, both during and outside working hours. Sexual exploitation and abuse threatens the dignity of people that humanitarian and development workers are supposed to assist and protect. Humanitarian and development workers are not allowed to have sexual relationships with anyone under the age of 18, even if it is legal in the country. Not knowing the person's age is not a valid excuse. Humanitarian and development workers are not allowed to pay for sex. They also cannot exchange employment, goods, or services for sex, or even suggest it. Humanitarian and development workers are not allowed to have sexual relations with anyone receiving assistance or services, even if that person is willing. If any of these principles are broken, Humanitarian and development workers can be disciplined and even lose their job. In many countries, they may also face criminal prosecution. 
What happens if Amar or Sarah or anyone in the community sees or suspects any sexual exploitation or abuse by another organization's worker? They must report any suspected or known exploitation or abuse they have seen or heard about. They should never investigate it themselves. It is somebody else's job to find out what really happened. If workers like Omar and Sarah are scared to report, they can report it anonymously through their organization's sexual exploitation and abuse focal point or their organization's reporting mechanisms. To keep that information confidential, they should not discuss it with anyone else. All humanitarian and development organizations should have a clear and easy way for people to share their concerns. We want all people to be and feel safe and protected from harm. Sexual exploitation and abuse takes advantage of vulnerable people and all of us are responsible for doing everything we can to prevent it from happening. Everything that Amara and Sarah have learned in this video applies to you in your role too. Whether you're a staff member, volunteer or contractor for a humanitarian or development organization. If you have any questions about this video or how to protect program participants from harm, please contact the safeguarding focal person or human resources representative in your organization. Or you can speak to your manager, protection, gender-based violence or other technical lead. For more information, visit www.interaction.org.